Christmas is a play set in a pub in the East End of London one week before Christmas Eve. And it follows the uh, lives of four men who gather together in this decrepit, kind of derelict, heartbroken pub. A pub that's kind of lost all sense of itself. You don't get pubs like that anymore, really. You don't get kind of pubs which are entirely dominated by kind of just men who want to get pissed. (laughs) (laughs) You know, pubs nowadays, you you can go and have a really nice bit of olive oil drizzled ciabatta bread and go and get a nice, really lovely Pinot Grigio. And and that's exactly as it ought to be. And they've become incredibly welcoming places for children, which is completely as it ought to be. But there's part of me that mourns slightly the culture of what simplistically might be called the kind of working man's boozer. Uh, and these are pubs that I used to drink in an awful lot at the end of the 90s when the play was written. I spent a lot of time in pubs like this um, and watched over the course of kind of a three, four, five year period as more and more of these pubs just closed down. At the time of conceiving the play, I was spending a lot of time reading Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard, which is a play that's really defined my sense of what theatre can be and what plays can be. Uh, And I became fascinated by the relationship between the Russian aristocracy at the start of the 20th century and the white working class of Britain at the end of the 20th century. Two kind of cultural pockets that, for reasons outside their control, were becoming increasingly redundant and powerless and lost. And I was fascinated by the melancholia of that sense of isolation and despair. Uh, and so transposed a lot of the dramatic engine of the cherry orchard into this kind of decrepit boozer on the cusp of Christmas Eve. Uh, and, and the play just takes place over one night when a stranger walks into the pub. <laughs> the play was written, you know, when I wrote the play, I, I, I knew very little, actually. The process of writing was very exploratory. All I really knew was that there was a pub I didn't even, in the very first draft, I didn't even really know it was Christmas. I think the Christmas thing came later. All I knew was that I wanted to write about this boozer and I wanted to write about these men. And they're four men who, in very different ways, are isolated and lost and whose lives have kind of passed them by and getting a sense that their lives are disappearing and not being able to articulate the sense of loneliness or fear they feel in the wake of this disappearance. You know, in many ways, it's a play, it's the only play I've ever written, with the exception of Seawall, which is a monologue. Uh, It's the only play I've written in which there are no women. All the actors are male actors, all the characters are men. And as a writer, I really enjoy writing women. You know, I I, I find it uh, really exciting. But there's part of me going into rehearsal last week, going into rehearsals of Christmas last week, it struck me that I've written no play in which women were so present and they were defined by their absence. And all of the men in some way or another have a relationship with a woman that they are, that they keen after and that in some way they've lost. Um, So all I knew was the men. You know, Michael McGraw, is the heart of the play, he's the landlord of the pub. And in many ways, he's very much inspired by my father, who, who, although never a landlord, my dad had a very different kind of life. But uh, my my dad's relationship to alcohol and money was very similar to Michael McGraw's relationship to alcohol and money. He lost a shitload of money and drank a lot to make up for the fear of that. Uh, and, And Michael's carved out of that phenomena. I think drama comes from interrupted ritual. I think that's what makes stories dramatic, and that's where stories start. You take a ritual, a ritual's repeated, and then one day it's interrupted. And that's definitely the case with Christmas. So there's a ritual for Giuseppe, for Billy Lee, and for Michael. They meet together, they drink together, they tell jokes, they smoke fags. This was a play written at a time when people could smoke in pubs. They swear their merry heads off, and then they go home. But one night, a stranger walks into the pub and this is Charlie Anderson. And he walks into this world and slowly and methodically and deliberately, for reasons which hopefully the audience will come to understand, he picks their worlds and their rituals and their routines apart. And he locks into the heart of their despair and tries to shine a kind of ferocious light on it. And that's how the play works. That's the mechanism of the play. I I wrote Christmas in a way that I used, that I wrote all my plays that that I wrote when I was a student 
all the plays that I wrote after I left university that nobody ever wanted to produce. Uh, that I wrote a play called Bring Me Sunshine that was eventually done in the Edinburgh Festival and then Bluebird which was done at the Royal Court and Christmas was the last of the plays written in this particular methodology which was to start with a blank page and start with a notion of characters and just have those characters talk to one another without knowing what the story was going to be, without really having any kind of intellectual ownership of the themes of the play but just uh, carving the story from out of the interaction between these imaginary characters in this imaginary space. So Bluebird, I just really knew that it was a cabbie and a series of punters. And Christmas, I just really knew that it was a boozer and a series of men. Uh, and the play was explored from that interaction, that imaginary interaction. And after that, I really changed my methodology. You know, Herons, which is the play that I wrote after Christmas, was the first of 10 years of plays, which I planned methodically before writing a word of dialogue, in which the dialogue was the last thing that I wrote. But Christmas was the last of the plays that I wrote from a position of exploration. And I, I suspect when I watch it, there'll be part of me that will really mourn and cherish the type of writing that comes out of that position of exploration. Where, you, where, you, where the writer doesn't know what the characters are going to say next, then quite often you can write things which are surprising and tangential and alive, I think. This morning, which is Friday the... what's the date today? the 20th of November, 21st of November, Friday the 21st of November, all of a sudden this play feels far more political than I ever realised it would. So we're talking today after UKIP won their second uh, seat in the Houses of Parliament and after the Labour shadow Attorney General retired having posted a photograph of a white van outside a house in England with the George's flags hung outside of it. We're talking at a time when the far right have harnessed and manipulated the desolation and despair felt by the white working class for specific, deliberate and cynical means. All of a sudden the isolation that I was writing about in Christmas, the isolation of a culture that's marginalised and skint has been deliberately manipulated by far right neoliberalist businessmen in order to get, to, to get political power. It's something the far right have always done, it's something the neoliberals have preyed on, is this sense of isolation and despair. Christmas is a play about that isolation and despair, but what's different about Christmas is those are characters who are unapologetically compassionate, unapologetically tolerant, defined by their tolerance, defined by their humanity. It's my conjecture that the white working class in Britain are as compassionate, as liberal, as nuanced, as intelligent and as humorous and as humane as any other, any other sector of society to watch the manipulation and the cynical manipulation by UKIP of that culture breaks my fucking heart and suddenly it strikes me this morning if we can do anything we can reclaim the humanity of the white working class that to me is something that Christmas does I used to be a school teacher and uh, I remember very vividly uh, the final Christmas before I wrote the play, sitting in the staff room of a school in Dagenham. And Dagenham is an area which is, which is really defined by the kind of white working class population and I loved it. I loved working there. I loved the kids I taught. I loved the staff I worked with. I thought they were brilliant and they were funny and surprising and alert and just ace. I was sitting in the staff room in the Christmas party and the Pogues' fairy tale of New York came on. I remember listening to that song thinking, you know, this is a song which has defined Christmas for a generation. But it's a song which is brutally unsentimental. It's a song which is fantastically lyrical, very funny, unapologetically lonely, and describes Christmas as a time of loneliness and a time of need. Yeah? Uh, and I thought, wouldn't it be great to write a play that does what that song does? And that was really the starting point of the, play, of the play, was an attempt to write a play which had the same gesture as the Pogues' fairy tale of New York. There's part of me that cherishes the fact that Christmas is also a time for swearing, for drinking, for smoking, for getting together with old mates and telling shit jokes. And that is the Christmas of my play. You know, don't bring your children, do bring your mates. I think it could be quite a fun night.